Hey yo, LAZ, after this episode, make sure you go check my bros over there at InSource TV and watch that Super Trife Low Life's interview part two with Face Low, you heard? Leave a comment, tell him Z-Man Suicide Polo with the Ski Man sent you. Hey yo, LAZ, man, if you need organic promo for your artists, your music, your brand, or your business, send me an email at thechenpopllc at gmail.com or hit me up at Real Saint Laz on Instagram. You heard? Hey, yo. Shout out to the bro Michael Lee Wood, a.k.a. Ohio Mike. One of the most dangerous prisoners in the history of Ohio State Corrections. You heard? Shout out to the bro Anytime TV for plugging us into the interview. He also plugged us in with that Chaos Loke interview. You heard? Shout out to the bro for letting us tap into that Ohio penitentiary history. But yeah, man, LAZ, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you hit that bell so you get a notification anytime I drop a new episode and you won't be out there lacking. You heard? Z-Man Suicide Polo with the Ski Man running around the hood like He-Man. Let's get it. And uh, by the time he woke up, I had tied him to my bars. I strapped the bomb on his back, put a gun to his, a zip gun to his head. And the first thing he said was, please don't kill me. I got a wife and four kids. And so I said, yeah, you should have thought about that for you talking all that motherfucking shit. Yeah, I come in at 18. And uh, I'm 64 years old now. I've been I've been down for uh, 45 and a half years since uh, March of '78. So I've been here for quite a few, and I've did most of my time here. Well, I did 17 here in the in the state of Ohio, and then uh, I did I caught some kind of murder cases in the joint. And, and uh, had, you know, bombs, bullets, and zip guns, and black powder, and all this other stuff. And then they gave it to the feds back in um, March of uh, 1995. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I went straight to the Supermax in uh, Colorado, the ADX. And uh, I spent 26 years in the feds, so, you know, I had the privilege, you know, just yeah, you know, I just gravitated toward the, the real good dudes. So, you know, when I went to the ADX, you know, it was all the high-profile dudes there that I got real cool with, like, um, um, <clears throat> Dr. Kerr, you know, I got pictures of us, me you know, and Dr. Kerr, and, and, uh, as a matter of fact, Larry Hoover was my next-door neighbor for six years at the ADX. Uh, and, you know, just a whole bunch of, you know, the, the cartel bosses, like, uh, Juan Brago and Juan Mata Belisarios and and uh, and even you know uh, even Barry Mills and them you know them, them dudes there which he ended up dying a few years ago and uh, you know he's the one who started that the uh, Aryan Brotherhood stuff in the old San Quentin back in 1968 and uh, uh, so I did a whole bunch of time out there in the feds then all over the country. And then uh, <clears throat> I came back here to Ohio 20, is see, in March of uh, 21, because when I was out at um, Hazleton in West Virginia, I had the yard out there for four years. And then um, a new captain came in and said he was gonna take back his yard because he said he thought I had too much control on the yard. So he put me in a hole and sent me out to uh, Victorville out there in California. It's, uh, it's on the high desert there. It's about 80 miles out of LA. But uh, before I left, I was able to put uh, a guy in charge of the yard. And when I say that, you know, everybody, all the gangs and, and uh, everybody else, they, they all had their shot callers. So when I say I'm in charge of the yard, I mean I'm in charge for all the white dudes. And uh, I'm the shot caller for them. So I put a dude named Freddie Gears in charge of the yard, which I had him running the, the one side of the yard for me when I couldn't get over on that side. And um, so I go out to um, Victorville, and I'm out there about two, a little over two years, and um, then they bring in uh, uh, Whitey Baldry, 
you love talking about, right? The big yeah. snitch from Boston. Yeah. Well, they bring him into the, into uh, Hazleton around about 11.30 at night, and then early in the morning, Freddie G's and a couple, uh, two other uh, Boston guys go over to his block and kill him, strangle him, you know, beat him up, and uh, put a sheet over him, put him in bed. Well, when they do their big investigation, because it's a high-profile prisoner, you know, like Whitey Bulger, uh, then somehow, you know, like whatever played out, the administration told him, well, because they was asking, how do these guys get over to this block when they're on the other side of, of the, uh, the prison? And uh, then they tell him, well, Freddie G's was in charge of the yard, you know, and then they said that Mike Wood put him in charge of the yard when he left. And uh, because my name came up, uh, Washington, the BOP in Washington, said I was, uh, since I was uh, um, a state prisoner just being housed in the feds, they said I was persona non grata and sent me back to Ohio to take me back. So that's why I came back. And now I've been back here in this Supermax in Ohio, in Youngstown, for two and a half years now. Why did they send you to the feds? Why they sent you to the feds from Ohio in the first place? Well, I had two murders in prison at Lucasville, the, the maximum security prison. I had two murders there, uh, you know, like five or five or six different stabbings, which, you know, I could have took their lives, but I chose not to kill them because it wasn't, wasn't things where you just had to kill them, you know, just take a body part or something. And, uh... Then I, you know, they got me for, um, mainly because I was embarrassed in the, the state because, um, you know, uh, when they, when I got my last murder case, they told me, you're never getting out. You're never going to be in, uh, see general population ever again. I said, all right, well then, uh, send me somewhere where I can start over and get out of population because I'm doing a life sentence and this is not going to work. I'm not going to accept this. They said, well, I don't know what to tell you. You know, you're going to be back here for the rest of your bit. So then I started, uh, you know, like took a guard hostage, tied it to my bars, uh, put a gun to his head, and, you know, and that's about all I did. I didn't try to hurt him or try to kill him or nothing like that. And, uh, um, you know, they, um, uh, making bombs. You was, you was formally charged for huh? both of those murders in the pen, though? No, no, well, I was charged with one, and then I went to a four-day outside trial and got found guilty, uh, not guilty by self-defense, and the other one, I wasn't even charged before. The self-defense the one. The charges I've had, yeah. The self-defense one, in, uh, what went down? What happened with, like, what happened? Uh, well, it was a, it was a, a big, uh, uh, well, that's it. There was a gang, you know, this white gang in here named the Brotherhood back in those days. Cause they had 38 guys in their clique. And, uh, uh make a long story short on that. The, the one that was running the, the gang was a dude named Billy Murphy. And he was a bad gambler, so he would always go out there and end up losing money in the day room and stuff. And he owed this other white guy a bunch of money. And rather than pain, he sent two guys to go stab him up and try to kill him. But he ended up surviving from it. <clears throat> well, he had a little uh, younger friend named Peters. And he was in the local control. He was getting out in a few, few weeks, like six weeks or something like that. So this guy grew up with my partners. You know, and, well, he didn't grow up with my, like my partners. knew his mother and father grew up with them. And... And uh, we had heard that um, that Billy Murphy was going to make have a move made, made made on him when he came out of local control, you know, to get him out of the way because where I, you know, where we come from here in Ohio, you know, you make moves on dudes and make moves on your partners. So uh, we heard that, and then Benny was saying they grew up with these guys, mother and father, on the streets. Said, yeah, I can't let nothing happen to this kid, fucking. You know, I've, I've known him all my life, and blah, 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 blah. And so um, we went and talked to Billy Murphy at the chow hall the next day that he, he had got that word. And the dude said, oh, yeah, yeah. And Billy, because Benny said, look, this kid ain't, 
they ain't gonna do nothing to you. You got my word, and you know, this kid's going home in a few months, and I'm gonna make sure he goes home. Uh, and the dude says, oh yeah, yeah, that's cool. Is that? But anyway, he when he leaves, he tells some of his gang members, like, man, fuck them guys. Uh, they, they, you know, they think they run this fucking joint, but uh, I'm gonna show them otherwise. I'm gonna have to make a move on him. If they don't like that motherfucker, I'm gonna make a move on him too. And uh, but one of their gang members, was booked down in the gym with us and he come and seen us. He said, hey, listen, man, I know this is gonna be a big clusterfuck right here. And this guy's, you know, he said he's gonna make a move on you guys. Cause this dude knew what was gonna happen. Them dudes were all gonna get clowned and uh, he didn't want to be part of that. So he told us everything about it. And uh, anyway, so when we go to our wreck that night, we go down strapped and everything and, and uh, <clears throat> The dude comes up and, and uh, so anyway, a, a, a big old fight breaks out with, with uh, a bunch of their gang members. But we, we brought a bunch of convicts in with us, you know, independent guys that are not picked up. And uh, so there's a big fight going on down there. And then uh, I I take uh, uh, Billy Murphy hits Benny through the hand where he raises his hand up to block a knife from going in his chest. So I attacked the dude, uh, Billy Murphy, the, the leader of this trick. And uh, anyway, but as we fall down this, the, the uh, bleachers, I get on top of him and then I, I, I stick him through the heart and, uh, and uh, kill him. I ended up killing him. Well, he didn't die for about a week because what I did was I, when I hit him through the heart, I sent, severed his aorta that pumps blood up to the brain. So when he, when they put him on life flight, uh, they they cut him open and sewed his heart up and was fibrillated it all the way back to the hospital, put him on life flight. I mean, uh, put him on, uh, uh, what do you call that? When they put all them machi uh, machines on you stuff, keep you alive. Life support. Life support, yeah, yeah. So they put him on life support and then a week later, they say, uh, you know, this dude ain't never coming back. He's got the uh, metal uh, thing of a burnout light bulb, basically what they were saying. So they, they called people in and gave him a parole right there in the hospital and said, uh, he's yours now. We, we paroled him to, to his family. What do you want to do? They said, uh, pull the plug. So they pulled the plug. He went into cardiac arrest and died. And then they charged us. They charged, actually they charged me one of my partners is on the streets right now, uh, BT, and they charged Benny Fields. That's another one of my partners. He went on to the streets about 15 years ago, but he died of a heart attack. And uh, so they, they gave us a four-day trial, come back like 40 minutes later and found us all three not guilty of self-defense. Uh, so, you know, that's, they can't do nothing about that one. And... Uh, then after we got out, which was 13 months later, we got back out in population. And uh, I'm walking down the hallway with my celly. And uh, one of these goofballs tries to make a move, but everybody stays strapped in, in, in Lucasville. And uh, he tries to make a move. You have so, one minute remaining. So when he pulls his weapon, I pull mine. And so I ended up getting out on him in the, in the, uh, in the, in the hallway. And this cam, you know, cameras are out there anyway. So, so when they say it's a self defense because he tried to sneak up on me, it's right on camera and fucking, I blocked his little shit and fucking, I ended up stabbing him to death. So I didn't even get indicted on that one. That was that was in uh in Ohio at Lucasville. That was back in uh, that was in January of '89, and then we went to trial in November of '89. So did and then you? I caught another that other murder case in '90. 90 after I got out because we got out of the patrol unit in February of 90 and then that happened in September of 90. Let me ask yeah. you this. So you, you were never yeah. involved in none of those white gangs? You was always an independent? I'm always independent, yeah. I've never been in a tip in my life. That was both two two people from the Brotherhood that you killed in self-defense? They called their gang the Brotherhood but they weren't the AB, you know, as you know, they were just a white uh, gang, you know, a bunch of white guys that hung around each other and tipped up. Oh, they was a whole different gang different. just called the Brotherhood that was existing in Ohio uh, only? Yeah, they were just called the 
other. That's just the name they had, but they weren't never they weren't A B dudes as you know as you know nowadays. What do you think was worse, Ohio State Penitentiary or the Feds? Well, that's a trick question because, like everything, you know, and if you did time, you know, like there's always good and there's always bad. I like I like. I, I like Ohio because you can just stand on your own, you know, like I, you don't have to be responsible for nobody else if you don't want to be, you know, other than maybe your partners or something like that. But you don't have to be responsible for everybody else. In the feds, you know, like you, like since I'm a white guy, you come in, you're, res- you're in a way, you're responsible for all them. For instance, like, if 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 someone if you're on the yard and a white dude's getting jumped by, you know, a black dude or a Spanish dude or something, you're forced, you're forced into helping that dude. You have to go help that dude. Same thing if a black dude's getting jumped by a white dude. White blacks are forced to go help that dude because see if you don't, because the politics is this way. If you don't then your career is over with, you know, you're going to be beat off of every yard you ever go to. And, uh, and, and if you keep coming back to the yards and they have to beat you off, then the next thing you go, they're going to stab you or kill you. Depends on which yard you go on. You know, some of them are more serious than others. But I don't like the politics that way because, you know, that's why I've never been in a tent because I'm not, I don't want to hurt anybody that doesn't deserve it, you know, just because some idiot's in a clique and he goes talking shit or disrespecting some good fucking convict, I don't want to have to go kill this dude because he puts his dude in the mouth where he kicked his ass, you know, and beat him down real bad, and, you know, then I'm going to, I don't want to have to go hurt this dude because he was in the right. Yeah. I don't like those federal politics either. Like, know what I mean, I don't want to. I don't. I don't. I don't know what another dude is doing, but when I'm not looking, that That's could right. cause problems for the whole, for the whole car. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, 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 was well, the, when was well, the when was the first time you ever in jail? Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that I've ever been in jail. I've been in jail juvenile time that I went to graduate from juvenile, went to the reformatory, got bounced over as an adult, went to the uh, reformatory when I was 16 or 17, and uh, then got out and was out, out on the streets for four and a half months, caught a murder case, and, and here we are 45 and a half years later. What what part of Ohio are you from? Canton, uh, from the Football Hall of Fame that and what, how did you end up in the streets in the first place? Like, what was going on in your household? Oh, well, not a, not a whole lot. I, I didn't, uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't have anybody, you know, I didn't have no, uh, no parents to, to really keep an eye on me and, or, or really give a shit, you know, as far as, uh, as far as, you know, um, how do you say it, uh, you know, caring about what you do for the most part. You know, it didn't matter if I come in, whatever time I came in, I came in and nobody paid any attention. Was it drugs in your household or alcohol abuse or what was it that your parents wasn't really involved? Yeah, it was, uh, there was no drugs. No drugs. I mean, in fact, I don't even, I don't do drugs, I don't drink. And, uh, and my father, though, my father was a quiet alcoholic. My mother, um, she just worked like two jobs all the time, so she never had time to do, uh, do much anyway other than work to try to, you know, because she had eight kids, so she had to support them because my father, uh, he was, you know, he would come and go for, you know, he, like he might be there one day and gone for two years, you know, go up like in the main stuff where he was originally born, and, and uh, so he was never around. But, uh, you know, other than that, you know, this was the way of life, you know. You, I lived in the projects most of my life, you know. Well, we lived in the projects. And, uh, you know, it was, it was good times, you know, when I was out there. I, just, I had nobody to show me how to do the right thing. 
which you know kept me running the streets at night but the crew I was running the streets with and we always end up getting into something. They had a juvenile state system out there? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, um, the first time I did time was like 12. I went to what they call juvenile diagnostic center up in, up in Columbus, Ohio. Then I've been to, you know, the Miami outside of Toledo, Ohio, and, and uh, you know, like a whole bunch of them, like a lot of them, except for ones, and then, um, then a couple times from them, they would send me to juvenile group homes to, you know, spend five, six months there or something. I ended up taking off from them. And, but yeah, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of juvenile joints. They got like a, a county jail, like Rikers Island, New York got Rikers Island. How is their county jail? Well, I haven't been in that county jail since 78, but when I was there, um, I was, I, again, I was, I was just fucking young, stupid, and violent, and uh, so when I went into the county jail, because uh, see, I, I ended up catching my case. Uh, well, actually, I caught my case when I was 17, but when I got caught, I was 18, so, you know, I was, I, then I was an adult. And uh, so when I went into the county jail, uh, you know, I was pretty violent in there and I ended up uh, hurting some dudes, you know, I guess too many at one time. And then they locked me up for a while by myself where I couldn't be around anybody. And then, but it was dudes that come in and, and uh, you know, plus I was young. And then I guess they thought that, you know, that they had a, uh, I guess they thought they had an even, uh, an even match or whatever, you know. I guess they thought they thought they were going to fight, but I wasn't even thinking about fighting. I was thinking about killing them, you know, back then. And so when they, you know, like talk shit or, or, or thinking about they was just going to get in the fist up some, I put that steel to them. And then I found it in the county jail. And most of them motherfuckers broke weak once you, you know, once they got a bite of that steel, they didn't want no more of it. Or the pipe, you know, I had a pipe too. But yeah, those were, those were those were some interesting times. What do you think made you violent in the first place? Uh, I don't know, man. Just just the way I grew up in the juvenile joints. You know, listen, I've been in the juvenile joints, uh, and I tell dudes this when I talk to them every now and then. I've been to some juvenile joints that are way harder than fucking, that were way harder than some of the prisons I've been in. Because, you know, kids can be vicious motherfuckers when they're young. And uh, we were, you know. It, we, didn't, we, I, we didn't understand what it meant to, you know, do the things that we were doing and the ramifications behind it. We had no clue that some of the stuff you look back on and say, damn, I could have got easily killed over that. But you're not even thinking that when you're a kid. You just it's the immediate what you what you're uh, thinking about. So you've been locked up on this case since 17 years old. Yeah, well, I, I didn't get caught until I was 18. But you've been in the in the oh. penitentiary since 18 years old, and you've been down for 45 years. Yeah, I come in at 18. And uh, I'm 64 years old now. That, that's insane. Why did they give you that much time? And how could they legally give you that much time at, a, well, at that because, age? Well, because I, I, was, I was 18 when I come in. And it, that, that's the law back then. And, and I got a life sentence for a murder case. And uh, actually, I had a partner with me. And we both got, uh, we got, both got life sentences. And... Uh, he, he did 28 years and kicked out. He's been out like 16, 17 years now. And, uh, but he was cool when he was in joint. You know, me, I was always, you know, I was, you know, I had the stabbings. I've had taken, like, I, like I'll give you an example. Like one time I was up on a range and they moved me from Lucasville to another joint and put me in the hole in the back of the, and they built a special door for the, in the back six cells on the top range where only I could be. Or, you know, the guards had to open it up to get to my cell. 
where they didn't want me around nobody. And uh, so there was this one guard, uh, big tall motherfucker. I used to call him Pizza Face because he had all these pop marks on his face, but he was a uh, ex-cop on the streets. And uh, so he used to come up there every half hour and he had to look in on my, in my cell, you know, see me. And so one, he used to look at me and I got some piece of shit. So one day I asked him, this was back in March of uh, 92. So I asked him, I said, hey, let me ask you something, man. You know me or something? You know me from somewhere? Because every time you look at me, you look like I, look at me like I'm some piece of shit or something. And he, and he stopped in front of my cell. He said, I used to be a I used to be a cop on the streets. I used to put folks like you in jail. Now I'm here babysitting you. Well, then I find out that he was, you know, that he was mad because he had a good job in another block. But they told him that him and another guy who was an ex-military uh, dude, they had to come over here to this hole, and their their job was to keep an eye on me. So I told him, I said, "Well, listen, okay. So now I'm a, now I'm a punk, right?" I said, "Well, let me tell you." Next time I get ready to do something, you're going to be my victim. How about that? And he just looked at me and walked on. And we had no words. It took me five and a half months to get him, but him and I snatched his ass up from my bars and knocked him out. And uh, by the time he woke up, I had tied him to my bars. I strapped a bomb on his back, put a gun to his, a zip gun to his head. And the first thing he said was, please don't kill me. I got a wife and four kids. And so I said, yeah, you should have thought about that before you were talking all that motherfucking shit. So I just bloodied his mouth and nose up and stuff. And then they brought a negotiator in by that time. You have one minute remaining. And uh, they were like, let him do it, let him go. So I said, man, I'm tired of hearing your voice. I'm gonna let this motherfucker go. You come on in and take his place. That motherfucker said, I'm, I'm not lying to you, would I'm not coming in. I said, well, shut the fuck up then. He ain't coming out either. How y'all was making bombs? I was, I was making bombs because I was getting in black powder, smokeless powder. Then I was taking my, uh, like when they, they take me out the wreck, I'd, I'd, I'd secrete like those pebbles and stuff in my sock and bring them back in and I'd take the syrup and put the syrup outside of my bomb and then I'd attach these, uh, these stones to it and I'd put uh, bullets, you know, bullets inside the uh, black powder or smokeless powder, whatever I have inside and then I would make my fuse by putting holes through uh, through uh, match heads. Then I would like, take the syrup from the morning tray when they had syrup and I'd put that out on outside and then I would stick it against it hard. So then I'd attach these rocks to the outer, outside of the strap though. And then I would, you know, put bullets, uh, 22s, 38s. I usually like the 22s because they're rim fire rather than the 38s, which I've had plenty of them too, but they're hard, they're hard to go on, you know, and they're dangerous if you don't have the right uh, zip gun to use because they, they got that firepower to them. And plus you gotta use like a nail or something because they're, you know, uh, you gotta hit them right in the middle in order to make those things go off. Or at least with the 22s, you know, you can put them in a, in like a pipe or anything, and, you know, and it's, they're easy, they're easy to go off. Anyway, um, um, and I would take uh, matches, and then I would put holes through the matches, and uh, cut the stems off, and have a string of uh, match heads, and then you know light them and test it, you know 1001, 1002, one thousand, just like that, and make sure that I get like a two or a four second fuse or something like that. And once I got enough of them like that, I know that when I put it on here, then it's gonna blow and four seconds or two seconds or however long I wanted. And that's how I used to make my uh, my wick. If I didn't have an actual wick, which most of the time I didn't, I had to make the wick myself. So was it ever a time in your history in Ohio where a prisoner actually shot another prisoner with a zip gun? Get there till 78. And uh, in 
in in uh, 73 a guy ended up getting a a, a regular gun in and uh he uh took a guard hostage he took a guard hostage on the range way in the back of the range and uh <clears throat> so they they uh you know they bring in a sniper and everything he's up in the front of the range with a sniper this guy's in the back with his gun uh on the guard and threatening the shooting and stuff like that well they they ended up telling the guard the sniper to take the to shoot him and uh so he gets beat on but he don't shoot the dude he he, shoot, he, he ends up trying to shoot him they shoots the other he shoots the guard and kills the guard so they get rainy and they they, they you know lock him up for the, that right there and uh and then later um uh after that well he got lucky because right after he did that they threw the death penalty out if you remember they threw it out in 72 and they threw it out back in 78 so he didn't get no death penalty over that stuff well later on the other guards they find out who brought the gun into him which was another guard that he had paid to bring the gun in they caught that guard one of the guard one of the other guards went down to a, a bar where the guy was at went in shot and killed him that that officer got uh seven to fifteen years for for killing him and then uh what you mean another officer suicide another officer took revenge on the a, a, a CO who, who smuggled the gun in yeah yep took the revenge on him and he got he got he went into a bar and killed him and then he went to court and got seven to 25 years for it and uh then the, the sniper who ended up killing the, the guard that was hostage he ended up committing suicide Damn. so it was a big old entangled weed there you know and then Rainey, they sent him to, they sent him out of state because of that, because they couldn't put him on death row, because they, they just did away with death row. So they sent him out of state to uh, Nevada, no, let's see, to, to uh, uh, Arizona at first. And then I heard years later, he got stabbed and stabbed up real bad by somebody down there. And then he went to Nevada and I don't know what happened to him. He might even be dead now, as far as all I know. I don't know what happened to him now. It is his, uh, his last, his, his name was Rainey. Rainey. R-A-I-N-E, -I, -I, -E, I think. N -E, see, R-A-I-N-E-Y, something like that. This picture with all the people in it, what's that though? That's the white car in the feds? That's just the guys that were under me at Victorville. Those were all the dudes that that uh that were under me at, at well that was all the all the white guys but most a lot of them that were in the picture. Yeah, that was at Victorville back in I don't know, two thousand fifteen or whatever. And that's you in the but, front? Uh, yeah, that's me in the front. Everybody else gathered around me. <laughs> Yeah, bro, but nah, these pictures are fire, though. You said they sent you to the feds just because they couldn't handle you, cause those, cause Ohio, the state, couldn't handle you. Right, right. They, that and that they were getting politically embarrassed because, like, they would come and shake me down, and they would like say like they would find uh, uh, bullets sold into my mattress or. Uh, black powder or whatever the case are or up in the workings up the top, top of the door I would have like two loaded zip guns up there and stuff and they'd take it all apart and find zip guns up there well all that stuff got in the news and stuff and what it was it was just a political embarrassment for the state of Ohio saying look at how can this dude this dude's running your fucking prisons for you this dude's getting guns in and putting live ammunition and then they they they, they would uh uh like, they arrested one guard for bringing me bullets in his, in his Frito bag, and he tried to give them to another guy to give them to me, and that guy told on him, so they, they arrested him with some bullets in his Frito bag, and then he ended up saying they were for me, and fucking ended up doing two years over it, and the snitch went to, to the, to Warren, where they 
you know, it's a one joint that they put on a on a high point on you know, all the ranch period. And uh yeah, it was just a big old cluster buck, so you know, they were still taxing me for what I did all those years ago, even though I had been gone for so long. And being cool. They were like, No, you still you you were violent and uh you had a you can't be around other staff and you can't be around staff and other prisoners because you're a predator and you know you you've done this and that and, and uh, you know the murder cases and the stabbings and the bombs and the bullets and the taking the guard hostage and and then I even got hacksaw blades in it and and literally here at, at, at Lucasville, Ohio, I literally sawed the door off, put the door put the door off the hinges, you know. And, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I took the whole fucking door off and sent it out on the range. And then they built a new joint in Mansfield, which had these big-ass steel doors on them, and, and the control unit there sent, I was one of the first five guys went there, and they fucked around and put these old heavy-ass 300-pound steel beds in the floor there. So, anyway, make a long story so all that, there's a lot of shit happened with the, but, well, this is not Lucasville, we don't pamper our prisoners, this and that. So... Uh, I told dudes, I said, hey, let's fuck this motherfucker. And so we kicked the beds off the floor and got them off and, and uh, ran the doors with them 300 pounds fucking beds and literally took the uh, doors off the hinges from, you know, from the other side. Not, not the door where you actually open it up to come out, but the other side where the hinges are at. We knocked them off the hinges and came out there and fought the police. So they're just taxing me for all that shit, you know, because, listen, I mean, uh, Jordan knows pretty well that there's nobody has done as much as I have done in, in this whole state, period. I was the first person in Ohio history ever sent to the feds disciplinary. Uh, there's only two of us that have two murders apiece in the joint, other than riot related stuff, because, you know, we had the big. Big riot in '93, uh, where I took it over, took the joint over for 11 days, and there was a lost riot in U.S. history. Um, but nobody has done as much as I just far as bombs, bullets, and everything like that. I just was smart enough to know that I kept all that stuff to myself to use it if I wanted to use it. But I didn't pass it out. Which I threatened to pass it out plenty of times just to make the motherfuckers nervous. But, you know, I wasn't going to pass it out to get somebody that didn't, you know, that didn't deserve to die, end up getting killed because some idiot used one of my, you know, one of my bullets and shot a motherfucker in the head or something. So I never passed out any ammunition to anybody else. Yeah, I got a, I got a partner too. Well, actually, like, my, he was, uh, we, we grew up together on the streets and the last time I saw him was 14 years old. And so I haven't seen him in like 51 years, you know? And we just started touching base in the last year that I've been back here. Uh, we, we reconnected and everything. And, and I usually call him every night and stuff. That's just like when I was doing something for unique, you know, he would like read the comments to me and stuff like that, or, or, or have a copy of it for he could play it to me over the phone and stuff like that. See how, you know, see if it sounded right. You know, I was mm -hmm. on little critical on you know, some of the stuff that goes on. I wanted to make sure that everything was right. I see you had a joint with Unique Mecca Audio. You was locked up with him? Yeah, yeah. We, I knew I knew Unique from the uh, from, from uh, ADX. I, knew, I met him in like 96. We, were, we went through the program together at this Federal Supermax in Colorado. And uh, matter of fact, uh, like the same thing he tells uh, Tell Jordan and everybody. He told him on the on the uh, tapes that he did. Like I'm the one that, because uh, he couldn't really read read and write real good stuff. I'm the one taught them guys, him and, and a bunch of other guys, uh, how to you know just to sit down and, and try to teach them how to read and write and stuff like that. And he had his law stuff and everything. So I took I took his law stuff down to where I worked and and we typed it typed it out for him and stuff like that for he could put the stuff in court. So yeah, we got we got cool there. I mean, we wasn't with these partners and nothing like that. Or real, real, real good friends. But he was a convict, and so I looked out for convicts. You know, when they need, you know, something like that, I felt that you know, a guy should have the opportunity to get back in court. So anyway, I took it down there and tacked all this legal stuff out for him, and 
that's how we got to know each other. So I I thought that that you know he wanted me to do a few things for him on his uh, podcast. So I'm like, you know, I did that, you know, as as his friend, you know, to see. Well, if you okay, this can I write something up for you? That's all well and good. It don't cost me nothing to sit here and and and, and uh, say whatever I'm saying. You know, whatever you want me to talk about. LAZ man, Gen Pop TV. You heard? I drop a lot more content than your average YouTuber. You know, so I know it's hard to keep up sometimes. But make sure you on that new and recent episodes playlist. And make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that bell so you don't miss about 30 episodes a month. You heard? I'm different out here. Hey yo, shout out to Ohio Mike. You heard? Considered one of the most dangerous prisoners in the United States of America. Locked down as of now for 45 and a half years. Been locked up since he was 18 years old. The first prisoner in Ohio state history to be kicked out of state prison and sent to federal prison because of misconduct. Comment gang, I need y'all to tear this up. You heard, share this to Facebook. We need all them likes, all them comments. If you're not subscribed to the channel, hit that subscribe button right now, hit that bell. You heard? Z-Man Suicide Polo with the Ski Man, get at me. And if you love how busy I get on this channel over here, feel free to send me a cash app donation at dollar sign, Gen Pop Fam. Some yards, like Florence, they don't give up warning shots, and they tell you, we don't give warning shots. If you're doing something, you pull a weapon out, and we feel somebody's life is in jeopardy, you're going to, you're, you're going to be killed. They'll tell you straight out. Well, all, all these knives were slinging, and people were getting stabbed, and then there's all these fights. The guard tower on the yard uh, opens his windows up, and he kills a white dude, shoots him, kills him, and then kills a black dude, and then everybody falls after that. Back in the, you know, back in the 70s, it was way different than how they do time these days. You know, the prisons, like Lucasville, where I, could, where, where I went and did my uh, maximum security time, you know, it was a, it was a really, really violent uh, prison. And uh, back in those days, there was no metal detectors in the hallways. There was no cameras in the hallways or, or in the blocks or nothing. You know, they didn't have stuff like that back then. <coughs> and uh, everything was built around, you know, everything was built around reputation. So as a young kid, when I come in, you know, you know and plus, I, you know, you gotta remember, I already did, you know, a bunch of juvenile, grew up in juvenile joints and then gravitated to, uh, graduated to uh, uh, reformatory time, which is in between uh, adult and juvenile. I did that time and then, then I came to prison. So I, I knew what, what, uh, what, what prison was about. So I wasn't like no new boy to it. But anyway, I, I went into Lucasville and, and being, you know, especially, you know, like, being a young kid, you're always going to be tested. I mean, everybody is, even today. You know, it's just not as restringent as it used to be back in those days. And uh, everything, like I said, was based on reputation. You know, how vicious you were in prison, that was your reputation. And people respected that. They respected strength. They didn't respect weakness. You know, weakness was always taken advantage of and exploited. And uh, so I think I was in prison for about, I want to say, two months, three months, and, uh, got, you know, got into an argument uh, in the chat hall with, uh, with a dude, and he thought, you know, just because I was a young kid, I, that he could try it, you know, that he could, you know, uh, 
uh, get out on me, you know. And anyway, we, we got into an argument and stuff, and he was like, you know, we'll bring your ass over back over here, you know, into the blind spot where we can fight. And, uh, you know, everybody carried a knife back then. Like I said, there was no metal detectors in the hallways or nothing. So everybody carried one. It was like a toothbrush. Everybody had one. And uh, he thought he was going to fight, but as soon as he stuck around the corner and turned around, I hit him in the stomach with this knife I had. And as soon as I hit him in the stomach, uh, you know, that took all the fight up out of him. So I hit him a couple of good things, good, uh, a couple more times for good measure. And he fell down and just, you know, put his hands up trying to block anything else I was going to hit him with. And I just walked away from him after that. And uh, they took him to the hospital, locked me up. And uh, so I, I think really, though I can't ever prove it, I think he told on me because nobody saw it. And uh, we was behind the corner, uh, out of the way of any, any police or anything. So I think he actually went to the hospital and, and uh, told on me. But that was the first, you know, that was the first of many, many incidents. You know, like I said, I had a, a bunch of staff, well, not a bunch of staff, like five of them over the, over the years. and in a couple of murder cases in the joint where I felt that, uh, you know, I didn't have no choice but to take their life. And so, you know, I didn't, I didn't sure from it, I did. But that's how prison was back then. You had to stand up for yourself. If you were standing up for yourself, nobody else was gonna stand up for you. And then when you got that reputation of putting some steel on somebody, then everybody respected you and that's what that's what made you make it in, in prison back in those days. Is that, you know, for example, like, dudes were talking about, hey, you know, this this, this guy, this guy, yeah, but, but I'll tell you one thing, that motherfucker, he would be quick to put some steel in your ass if you fuck up. And uh, so anyway, that's how everything was back then. It's not so much, I mean, the violence is still, happens in prison, but it's not like it used to be in the old days, because in the 70s, we used to be able to train, like in Lucasville, literally, we used to be able to train with, with uh, cut-out weapons, uh, like, especially like the knives, we used to train with them in 